Welcome back to Anxiety Slayer. I'm Shan Vanderleek here with my wonderful friend and co-host Ananga Sivier. Today we're going to be talking about how to release trauma that is stored in your body. Welcome back to another episode, Ananga. Hey, Shan. So let's dig right in. Trauma is always stored in the body. It's deeply rooted in our subconscious mind and in the connective tissue of the body. And that is something that I only learned within the last, I don't know, five to 10 years or so that, that trauma really is right there in our bodies until we address it. I just find that fascinating. Yeah. A few years ago, I was listening to a seminar with Dr. Vasant Lad, who's a world renowned Ayurvedic teacher, and he gave this detailed teaching on Ayurveda and how unprocessed emotions and psychological memories that aren't released lodge specifically in the connective tissues and organs of the body. So that was new to me and that was something I went on to really look into and became quite fascinated by. So it's not something we always hear or we're always aware of and it's a great thing to explore because then we can do some healing work and and some release. And these emotions and memories are what can cause fear, anxiety, anger, grief, and even cravings. And they adversely affect our health and our vitality on all levels, physical, emotional, and spiritual. This is really potent, unprocessed junk that's just kind of stuck in our bodies. And the cool thing is we can do something about it. Yeah, I think it's a really important thing for us to explore. One of my favorite teachers gives the example of an iceberg. You know, we've got what we're presenting above the surface. That's what people see. That's our functioning, the face we're showing to the world. We often talk about high functioning anxiety. That's us on the surface. But we know that the majority of an iceberg is beneath the surface. And he was using that example of the subconscious mind that's driving us. It's driving our emotions. It's driving our cravings. It's driving the choices we make that we think are going to bring us some comfort or some diversion, but aren't really serving us well. It's all happening there beneath the surface. And Ayurveda teaches that the subconscious mind and the connective tissue of the body work together, that the connective tissue is the holding place for what's going on in the subconscious mind. Actually, Dr. Laddie has a saying, the issues in our tissues. Mm -hmm. And this connective tissue that you're referring to is what's known as fascia, the tissue that's woven around every part of our internal body. And Gosh, this just explains why we might experience pain and fatigue in our bodies that are directly related to trauma. Yeah. So, when we're talking about often with anxiety and stress, we can experience random body pains. And this gives a framework of why that can happen. And and of course, when we're anxious, the mind goes to it and it has a whole story around it. So, another reason why it's helpful to understand this. In the seminar I listened to with Dr. Ladd, he described the fascia as being like the white part that holds the segments of an orange together. And I found that really helpful. So I thought I'd share that. It gave me a good visualization and a good understanding. So he described that, you know, when you peel an orange and you have all those segments, there's, there's those white area of the orange that holds the segments together. And you can peel it back and you can take the juicy part of the orange out. but That's what gives the structure Mm -hmm. of of the orange. So we have that tissue within us called fascia that's around all our organs, and it's just woven around every part of our body, our nerves, all of our structure, this white web tissue is woven throughout, and it's holding our subconscious fears, issues, anxieties, and if we've experienced trauma, which if we're honest, we all have to a greater or lesser degree, you know, cumulative small t traumas are also having their significant impact on our well-being and our health and the quality of our life. So all trauma, all things that are impacting us subconsciously is going into this tissue. 
in the body. And thankfully, there's a lot that we can do, that each of you can do listening in, that will help you. And this is where the emotional release and recovery comes in. And we're just going to share a handful of different areas that you can explore to help with this emotional release and recovery. And it begins with treating yourself with kindness. I can't express how important it is to change up your internal dialogue, that that dialogue that might be really hard on you. It doesn't help. It makes things worse. Try to treat yourself the way you would a trusted friend, somebody that you love. Really check yourself and be kind, be sweet to yourself. Yeah, I think really slowing down and processing these teachings. When I first heard these teachings, I got a pen and paper and I sat down and really studied them and really reflected on them because I found it fascinating. And then I started to have some thoughts and feelings arise, how that might be affecting me in my own life. And then I set about, you know, making it personal and seeing what I could do about that. And it's ongoing work because we're all carrying so much. We're all impacted by so much. I think it's really important not to be expectatious, not to feel that there are things that we should have you know, recovered from. Somebody said to me a while ago, after I'd been through a very difficult experience, well, I would expect you should be over that by now. Mm. And I said, what benefit does it serve me by not being over it? Why would I not want to be over it? Right. So, you know, things take as long as they take. Sometimes we need help. Sometimes we need processing and that can accelerate the healing. We need support. We're going to talk about that more in a, in a minute. But the first thing we need is self-respect. Mm-hmm. That whatever we're going through is what we're going through. It's doing what it's doing and it's taking as long as it's taking. Yeah. One of my teachers would say, it is what it is and it does what it does. Right. <laughs> and it's not something that is based on anybody else's timeline anybody else's opinion or judgment or what have you. It's, it, this is truly a case of it's all about you and looking after yourself. Yeah, not judging ourselves, not being rigid with ourselves. The thing is with trauma and emotional release, the whole mood around it is softening, mm-hmm. softening and releasing, fluidity and releasing. We can't do it when we're rigid. And when we're tense and when we're not being compassionate with ourselves, that's a rigidity. So really turning to ourselves with patience, kindness, being open to learning more and seeing what path we want to take to to get help and to find ourselves in a more emotionally peaceful state. And there are several things that you can do right now to begin. You can start a breathing practice. You can make sure that you're walking, that you're getting out and getting fresh air and sunshine and being amongst nature, allowing for how much time, whatever that looks like, just allowing for that softening and that healing to kick in. And you're going to have challenging days and you're going to have days where you feel like, oh, I've got this. I'm I'm doing so much better, and you just stay with it. And if you feel like it's taking too much time, or if you feel like this isn't something you can do on your own, please do seek support. There are so many people available that can step up and support you as you work through this release and recovery. Yeah. These days we hear a lot about trauma-informed support, and that's what we need. We need to be able to talk with people who understand the impact of trauma. There are wonderful authors and speakers around, like Gabor Mate, who's just um, released a new book called The Myth of Normal. He's a very interesting person to learn from. It's a good book. I'm about halfway through it. Yeah, he's a wonderful teacher and expert in trauma, and there are many others. It's not 
um, helpful to speak to somebody that doesn't get it, somebody that doesn't understand. That can make us feel more isolated and it can increase our suffering. So really important to speak to somebody who's trauma-informed, somebody who understands the impact of trauma because it really is its own thing, the way it affects our mind. It can even affect the structure of our brain. Mm -hmm. So very important to be able to talk to somebody who understands that and who can help us. It really is because I I had an interview uh, recently that that we'll be releasing um, the third week in May with Adam Benelli. And had he met with somebody who was informed? And somebody who had a little bit more of a kind bedside manner, he may have been able to avoid a decade of trauma and suffering. So we know how important it is to choose your therapist, choose the person that you work with, no matter what you're addressing, with care. And if it doesn't feel like a good fit for you, then move on and find somebody else until it does. Mm, which is one of the things we appreciate about BetterHelp, that that's options available to, to move on until you get a, a good fit. Really important that who you're talking to, you have you know, a warm, supportive relationship with them where you feel respected, you feel understood. It's one of the most distressing things to get yourself to the point where you're ready to to unburden your mind or speak about something that's very difficult for you to speak about. And then you just feel that there isn't that rapport and that understanding. It's a really difficult experience. So definitely important to have the right person to talk to. Yeah, because that transparency and vulnerability is, there's so much courage involved anyway, that when you dig into exploring healthy emotional release, and letting those emotions flow, that you know that you have the understanding of somebody who, who can help you with that. Mm. You've been able to do that with me for years, but because you know me so well, being able to work through stuff together, uh, and I know I've been, a- been able to be there for you in that way too. It's just uh, a big component, a key component in moving through trauma is having that partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Trust. Just complete trust. Yeah. And then also we we look at things like yoga and how yoga naturally involves stretching our connective tissue. Myofacial release is a therapy that's developed to release tension and trauma in the connective tissues. It's a wonderful practice. Any massage or body work can be helpful, especially if you go for a while and go with the intention to release and heal. I've been doing body work and shiatsu now for years and alternate them. And I just can't even express how helpful it's been to just continue to release, 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 and to be in a place where I trust my therapists. And because sometimes a lot of emotions come out on the table. (laughs) Yeah. And that's a really good way to know that something beautiful is happening, that healing is happening. Definitely. Yeah. And you can look up my fascial release on YouTube. There's some uh, accounts there demonstrating how that works and teaching about it. Mm -hmm. And frequently they're sharing the intensity of emotional release when traumas unlocked from the body. Yeah, and to know that that's normal, to know that that's okay, and to just let it go. That's part of the release, part of the beauty of saying yes to that kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. And when you're with experienced practitioners, that's what they're facilitating and that's what they're used to. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's supported and understood. The emotion arises and like a wave, it rears up and crashes to the shore, and then very often people feel very peaceful soon afterwards. Mm -hmm. And of course, EFT tapping is helpful in releasing trauma that's stored in your body. 
We can use tapping in many different ways to release trauma. We can tap through a traumatic memory for release. We can also tap daily while breathing and affirming that we want to release trauma from our body and from our mind. Yeah, we have a guided practice in one of our courses on Teachable. I think it's the Social Anxiety course. But this session is also available on our Patreon. It's called the Story Release Tapping Process. Mm. And um, that talks you through how to release one specific traumatic story at a time. If it's a very intense memory, we would strongly recommend that you work with a qualified practitioner, not work with anything too heavy on your own. And then journaling is also a good choice as you're moving through releasing this trauma. And journaling after tapping, journaling after having a session, what came up for you? What were you able to release? Uh, What more would you like to release? Getting really personal and taking that to the page. We spoke about the power of journaling in a recent episode, and we recommended the work of James Pennebaker and his book, Opening Up by Writing It Down. He's spent decades researching writing trauma and difficult memories and how journaling can help release. So there's many ways to to go about it. Sometimes it's really helpful to explore a combination, journaling and some body work or tapping support, myofascial release, journaling and walking every day as a clearing practice. There's a beautiful story of a woman who spent a year walking through complex grief and sharing how the trauma related to that particular story that she was living, how she walked through that every day over time and what that brought her. So many different ways we can support ourselves. Sometimes we might choose a couple of things together and often really important to seek help and guidance and some support along the way. This episode of Anxiety Slayer is sponsored by BetterHelp. We give so much to our family and friends and our workplaces. And it's super easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you might need from yourself. When we spend all of our time giving, it can leave us feeling overwhelmed and frankly burned out. And therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. Therapy isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. It's also helpful for learning life balance skills, learning how to set boundaries, and it empowers you to be the best version of yourself. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire. You'll get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Slayer today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Slayer. Before the break, we were talking about some of the ways that you can release trauma that's stored in your body. And we have a a few more to-dos up our sleeves to share with you. And it begins with breathing and self-observation. Both a breathing practice and a self-observation practice are going to help you through releasing trauma. When we breathe with our memories, when we can sit with them and breathe with them, they stop affecting our present. They stop crashing in so much on the present moment. Sometimes, you know, we have these emotions surface or resurface, memories that can flare up. Sometimes they get triggered. We might smell something, see something, or just they seem to flow up to the surface. If we can drop our shoulders and breathe, Breathe with the memory rather than try to really push it away or stuff it back down because we know it's just going to come back again. Then that helps send a signal to our minds that 
we're receiving it, we're receiving that memory and we're, and we're being with it and it takes the intensity out of it. So to just practice when things come up, breathing, reassuring ourselves, comforting ourselves as we stay present. And self-observation is incredibly potent when we practice watching our thoughts and emotions come and go. Watching them come, watching them go. I think of it like a, a wave coming in from Lake Michigan, crashing to the shore, the water heading back out, just that ebb and flow. It's such a helpful practice to just let them come and go rather than to get stuck by them. Mm-hmm. This is where we can notice patterns, see where we can increase compassion for ourselves and and others, frankly. Yeah, really important work that's strongly recommended in Ayurveda is to watch ourselves, self-observation. Again, helpful to have a guide with that because we can be experts at masking even to ourselves or especially to ourselves. And also looking at patterns, looking how we usually respond to things, to catching ourselves, noticing where we can be more compassionate towards ourselves and towards others in our lives. Trauma can have a very heavy impact on our relationships when we're living through that lens of past traumatic experiences. And there's a great teaching I heard this week. I was listening to a lecture by Richard Raw, really fascinating lecture, talking about how to be peaceful and present. and He gave the saying, how you do one thing is how you do everything. Oh, I've heard that many, many times over the years. Yeah. Yeah. So to watch how you do one thing, and then that's how you do everything. When I started watching myself a few years ago after a a difficult event I'd been through, I noticed it when I was brushing my teeth, funnily enough. a strange place to catch yourself, but it was really instructive. And I noticed I was gripping my toothbrush like I was hanging on to it for dear life. And there was so much tension in my hand and my arm. And then I would notice that that would go into my meditation practice, the time when I was supposed to be most present and most peaceful. I would be holding my my shoulders and my arms in tension. So it's really helpful to regularly check in on ourselves. How you do one thing is how you do everything. It's going to be how we talk to ourselves, how we talk to others, Mm. how we prepare our meals, how we bathe, how we work, everything. There's going to be this thread that we'll see running through it. I was talking to a friend about it yesterday, and she was thinking about it in terms of attitude. Mm -hmm. She did one thing was how she did everything, and it was holding herself highly to account with a tendency to be very expectatious of herself and how that went through everything. I can identify with that one. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Many of us can. Or if we're anxious, what happens when anxiety rises in us is it creates this pattern that Ayurveda teaches that we tend to expect things to be worse than they really are. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be there with us. We're going to, you know, see the post come through the door and worry what's the mailman bought or the phone might ring and we're going to worry about what that could be. Something happens in our body and we worry about that, what that might be. Everything seems to have this kind of context to it that it could be something of concern. And that's a really exhausting way to live, but it's what happens when we're running these subconscious patterns that we're talking about supporting. So that's a really important teaching. And I was grateful to Richard Raw for reminding me of that. How you do one thing is how you do everything. And I've noticed that in relation to that, the more I show up in kindness toward myself, the more that just ripples out to everyone else in my life, where I might have been more expectatious or I might have been more intense in areas that really don't require that intensity, more that I soften and sweeten things up, it's made all the difference. And this teaching that we're talking about, this self-observation, it's just not to push 
these emotions away, these tough emotions away, or to repress them, but also not to cling on to them. So when, when something shows up, when you're sitting with this, oh, how, how do I do one thing? And what does that look like for me to just notice it? What is it? Oh, I might want to try, I want, might want to practice something different this next time. I want to be aware of the choices that I'm making. Before we got together today, you and I were both sharing how we need to slow down and dropping things, spilling things, whatever can happen in the kitchen happens to both of us <laughs> when we're trying to do too much at once or when our mind is not focused on being in the present moment and to be okay with that, to, to notice it and go, oh, okay, I need to slow down. I need to focus on what I'm doing right now. And that's it. I'm done with it. I don't need to make it into anything else. Yeah, sometimes we're doing everything at a run, mm -hmm. especially if we're anxious. But when the vata energy that drives anxiety rises in us, it's very hard to sit still and quiet. Mm -hmm. If somebody by nature is of a vata constitution, it's almost torturous for them to sit still and quiet. It's very difficult for their nature. So although we benefit so much from doing that, and it's something we need to learn to do, it can be a real challenge. And when we tend to do everything at a run, and that's the pace we're used to doing things at, then when we try and do something to address anxiety and we recommend breathing practices, walking peacefully in nature, it can be very difficult to take the speed out of that and, and be present. It can just feel so unfamiliar, mm -hmm. which is why we often recommend guided breathing practices and guided meditations, because then you have somebody with you, who's experienced, who's going to set the pace and shepherd your mind through, and that can be easier and, and more helpful. And it really is. When, when you notice fear or anxiety rising up through your body or these traumatic memories resurfacing, it might feel completely counterintuitive to sit and breathe. But if you practice sitting and breathing, if you practice, we have uh, guided breathing exercises, we have guided meditations. If you do that, you're going to learn how to let those memories come and go, just like your inhalation and exhalation. It's not magic, it's not snap your fingers, but it, it's a process, it's a practice, and it works. Yeah, it's taking the story out. Often we, we feel triggered by things we hear and it brings something up. But very often what we're trying to process is just is what it is. It doesn't have to have a more complex story around it other than, mm -hmm. you know, okay, this has come up and I feel really intense or it's made me feel afraid. Firstly, to turn to ourselves with kindness is understandable. You feel stressed or afraid or, or this is bringing stuff up for you. That's what's happening. That's as you said earlier, that that is what it is. That's what's happening. We don't need to further cause ourselves suffering by scrutinizing it, um, being impatient with ourselves around it, or the other stories that we bring in. What if I feel like this forever? What if it means this? Mm -hmm. You know, what if it's never gonna go away? Just practice letting it be what it is. It is this, and it feels how it feels, challenging, fearful whatever it is, and to practice breathing with it and being with it and letting it come and go is a recommended practice for anxiety attacks. Mm -hmm. If we can take the mental dialogue out of them and let them just come and then we breathe and we stand still, some people are very brave with anxiety attacks and they'll say to their mind and body, okay, what else have you got? Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, the energy dissipates. It's like a big wave that crashes over your head. Or a hot flash. Or a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it's going to take you out. Yeah. But then in a few seconds, it starts to lose its power. Yeah. And it fades away. And once we've learned to stand firm and breathe through either of those <laughs> examples, <laughs> then they lose their intensity over us. And we understand that, you know, it's a this too shall pass. And they pass very quickly once we know how to do that. Right. And please note that 
and we've mentioned this several times in this episode, all of this may be something that you need extra support with, whether through counseling, body work, myofascial release, uh, or working with an Ayurvedic practitioner. There are many, many ways to approach and to release trauma. And our invitation to you is that you find the support that feels right for you and helps you keep moving forward where you can feel safe and supported. Yeah, it's a journey. We, we have to allow ourselves the gift of it being a journey. And we might need to experiment a little with the support we choose and have some flexibility around it. Mm-hmm. But to just give ourselves that patience and open-heartedness to see where we can get help and see where it leads us. Thanks for listening to Anxiety Slayer. If you love our podcast, consider becoming a patron and you'll get over 150 guided relaxations, tapping sessions, and Ayurvedic teachings for anxiety relief at patreon.com slash anxiety slayer.